Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing high-density lipoproteins. Okay, so we're in the process of looking now at how high-density lipoproteins and low-density lipoproteins deliver their cholesterol esters to uh, hepatocytes. We've seen the HDL particles uh, just deliver their cholesterol esters to the hepatocyte without actually being endocytose themselves, whereas the LDL particles are going to be completely endocytosed into the hepatocyte and then they'll be broken down. So we're currently looking at this endocytic pathway basically. So we've seen that the LDL receptor which has the LDL particle bound to it will be endocytosed via clathrin mediated endocytosis into an endocytic vesicle. The clathrin will then uncoat from the endocytic vesicle and the endocytic vesicle that's now uh, free of the clathrin will come and fuse with an intracellular organelle called the early endosome, resulting in the um, LDL receptor with its cargo uh, going into the early endosome lumen. And then what will happen is another little vesicle will bud off the early endosome, okay, like so, and this will contain both the LDL receptor and its LDL cargo. Okay, so we're going to ship it on, basically, to another endosome. Okay, and this is going to be the late endosome. So we'll have another endosome here, and we're going to have a little vesicle going between the two, basically. Okay, so here's the endocytic vesicle that came from the plasma membrane to the early endosome. Now we've got another little vesicle delivering uh, the LDL receptor with cargo from the early endosome to the late endosome. Okay, so let's colour this in again. So in orange here we have the apolipoprotein B100. Okay, and I think I'll colour in the LDL receptor as well in green there. Okay, so here's the LDL receptor. Right, so this then is going to take this to the late endosome. So let me draw the late endosome here, which is another one of these membrane-bound organelles. So this is the late endosome. Now, something more interesting is going to happen within the late endosome, because the late endosome has an extremely low pH, okay, so it's extremely acidic in there, remember, whereas you become more acidic, the pH goes down, okay, so you've got a very high concentration of free protons within the early endosome. Now, what's the significance for this? Well, remember when I was talking about how the apolipoprotein B100 binds to the type A repeat domain of the LDL receptor. Okay, um, the apolipoprotein B100 has basic residues within it, and the type A repeat domain of the LDL receptor has acidic residues within it. Okay, now the significance of it going now into a very high proton concentration environment is that those acidic residues within the uh, type A repeat domain of the LDL receptor are going to become reprotonated. Okay, so they'll go from being their conjugate bases where they've lost their protons to being the neutral uh, amino acid residues where they have protons attached to them. Now, when they're neutral, do you think they're going to be able to interact with the positive charge on the apolipoprotein B100? No, is the answer. So what will happen is they will cleave apart, basically. So in the, uh, sorry, in the late endosome, what's going to happen is... Um, the LDL receptor is going to cleave away from the LDL particle. Okay, so they're now going to separate. Then what's going to happen, so if we draw the LDL receptor that's now on its own over here, okay, so it's going one way and we'll have the LDL going the other way, okay, we're going to pinch off vesicles from the late endosome which contain now just the LDL receptor. Okay, so here's our LDL receptor. And these vesicles will then go back to the plasma membrane. Okay, so here is the vesicle containing the LDL receptor, and it's going to go back to the plasma membrane so that we return the LDL receptor to the plasma membrane, basically. So this is a recycling process here. Okay, so that will go to the plasma membrane, which I'll just abbreviate as PM for plasma membrane. 
Meanwhile, what will happen is the LDL will go another way and it will have a vesicle pinch off from the late endosome which just contains it. But it's not going back to the plasma membrane, okay? It's going somewhere much, much worse. Okay, so here is our LDL particle, now in another little vesicle, and now it's going to go to structures called lysosomes. Okay, so let's have a lysosome over here, and you're going to have this little vesicle coming from the late endosome, which will be going to this lysosome here. So let's colour in the lysosome in a special colour, in purple here. This represents the lysosome. Okay, and the lysosome is full of enzymes which are going to break down the LDL particle. So now our LDL particle is coming to this slightly larger uh, vesicle-like structure known as the lysosome. Okay, and you have multiple lysosomes within your cell. Okay, and what will happen is this will fuse with the lysosome membrane and then in comes our LDL particle into the lysosome. And what's going to happen is that the enzymes within the lysosome are going to break down the LDL particle completely. So, for instance, the apolipoprotein B100, which has gradually shrunk in my pictures, um, not, not intentionally, uh, is going to be broken down into little fragments of protein. Okay, the lecithin molecules, okay, so here, these phosphatidylcholine molecules which make up the phospholipid monomer, those are all going to be broken down to release fatty acids and glycerol and other such things. Okay, uh, The cholesterol that's in the phospholipid monomer, that will be spared. Okay, The cholesterol will be conserved. You're not going to break the cholesterol down. The cholesterol esters which are in the centre, all you're going to do there is hydrolyze that ester link between the long chain carboxylic acid and the cholesterol molecule and therefore you're going to release more cholesterol. So the overall message here is that you are getting cholesterol, cholesterol, cholesterol. Yes, you're getting a few other things as well such as fatty acids which can just be used in metabolism but the overall thing we're delivering most of is cholesterol, okay? So, we can now reconverge the two pathways. So this is LDL delivering cholesterol into the hepatocytes, okay? HDL we've seen is also delivering cholesterol into the hepatocytes. It's delivering its cholesterol esters out of its core, with, but the cholesterol esters will then be broken down to cholesterol. Okay, so both of these pathways are dumping cholesterol into the hepatocyte cytoplasm. Now, what's the result then of dumping cholesterol into the hepatocyte cytoplasm? Well, the same process has happened in the, the peripheral cell ages ago now uh, is going to happen within the hepatocyte. Okay, when cholesterol goes up, what will happen is oxysterols will also go up. And you remember when we were discussing oxysterols, I told you about 24S25 uh, uh, epoxy cholesterol, okay, which was an example of an oxysterol that was specifically found in high uh, levels within the liver cells. Okay, so let me just remind you of the structure of 24S25 epoxy cholesterol, which is one of the key oxysterols found within hepatocytes. Okay, so here's the A ring of our steroid structure. Here's the B ring of our steroid structure. Here's the C ring of our steroid structure. And whoops, here's the D ring of our steroid structure. Okay, we've then got an alcohol group coming off here. We've got that double bond between the 5th and the 6th carbon, a methyl group coming off the 10th carbon, a methyl group coming off the 13th carbon, and then we've got our group up here coming off the 17th carbon. Okay, so remember the numbering system was this one was 18, this one was 19, this one was 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, uh, 26, and then 27. Okay, so what we're going to produce is an epoxy link between the 24th and the 25th carbon there, and that's 24S25 epoxy cholesterol. Okay, so this is a decent example of an oxysterol present within the liver. Now what will happen is the oxysterol will then go and bind with the liver X receptor within uh, the nucleus of the hepatocytes. 
Okay, so let's just remind ourselves of this, and this time I can get it right. Okay, so here we have this heterodimer of these two receptors that are within the nucleus. Okay, one is the liver X receptor, and hopefully you'll remember me telling you that there were two types of liver X receptors. There was the liver X receptor alpha and the liver X receptor beta, and the main form that's found in the liver is the liver X receptor alpha. Okay, so we can now say, since we're specifically talking about hepatocytes, that this is the liver X receptor alpha. Okay, then we've also got a retinoid X receptor here, the RXR. Okay, now... Usually, uh, when there are no ligands bound to either the retinoid X receptor or the liver X receptor alpha, this heterodimer here, this liver X receptor, a retinoid X receptor heterodimer, will be bound to certain co-repressors. And there's not just one of these, there's multiple. But to keep this simple, we'll just say there's one. Okay, so it will bind to co-repressors, and this complex will then bind to promoter regions of certain genes that are involved in responding to too high cholesterol levels, and it will repress their expression. Okay, so if there's no ligand bound to either of these receptors, that indicates that cholesterol cannot be very high within the cell because otherwise there will be oxysterols present, such as 24S, 25 epoxy cholesterol. Okay, and therefore we do not want to be activating the genes which are involved in excreting cholesterol from the cell, basically. So that's why they repress. The, the transcription of those genes. However, when cholesterol is high within the cell, you'll produce oxysterols such as 24S25 epoxy cholesterol, and the oxysterol can then bind to the liver X receptor here. So let's cover this, color this in. Here is our oxysterol. So this means potentially this molecule here, this little green egg that we've got here. Okay, we've then got the liver X receptor in orange here, okay, and the retinoid X receptor in green here. Okay, what will then happen is you'll shed the co-repressor, okay, so get rid of this, and replace it with coactivator proteins. Now again, there's not just one of these, there's multiple, but for our purposes we can just abbreviate them to coactivator. Okay, so the co-repressor's gone, the coactivator's here now. This complex now activates those same genes that it was repressing before, so that you express more of them. Now, what are the genes which you activate in the liver, which are going to help you excrete cholesterol? Okay, well, there are three that are extremely important. Okay, two of them are going to be ABC transporters. So, one is the ABC transporter G5, okay? The other is the ABC transporter G8, okay? And I think I'll start by discussing these two ABC transporters, and then we'll come back to the third protein that I want to discuss, which uh, this complex is going to increase the expression of. Okay, so basically, both of these ABC transporters are half transporters. So they need to um, dimerize, basically, and they usually form homodimers to produce active transporters, which can then uh, pump cholesterol out of the cell. Okay, you might say, but this is completely cyclic. They can't just pump it out of themselves. But where are they going to pump it back into, rather? Um, they're not going to pump it into the blood, is the answer. They're going to pump it into the bile ducts, okay? And that's the important point. So let me just draw a picture of what these half transporters look like. So remember, they'll have a single nucleotide binding domain at their amino terminus, followed by these, this cluster of six membrane-spanning alpha helices, which makes up their single transmembrane domain here. So this is the nucleotide binding domain down here, or the ATP binding cassette, whilst this is the transmembrane domain up here. And here's the carboxylic acid terminus. Right, so you need to dimerize these things together to make a transporter. And when they do dimerize together, they transport cholesterol out of the cell. Okay, so remember, hepatocytes are all in contact with a bile duct. Okay, so if this is our hepatocyte, one side of the hepatocyte will be facing the blood. Okay, so here it's facing the blood. 
Okay, and this will be the side with the scavenger receptor B1 and the LDL receptor on it. And I admit that I, in a previous picture, had the scavenger receptor B1 and the LDL receptor on the opposite side. Uh, let me correct that now. Uh, put them both on the same side, facing the blood, basically. Okay, so here's the scavenger receptor B1. And here is our um, LDL receptor here. Okay, so those will be removing the cholesterol from the blood in the form of HDL and LDL particles. Okay, and then what you're going to do is you're going to put these transporters on the other side, which faces the bile duct, basically. And both of these transporters will transport the cholesterol into the bile duct. Okay. Uh, in, and that's an active transport process, so they'll use ATP to do this. So this is ABCG5, and then we've also got ABCG8 here as well. Okay, so that's how we're getting the uh, cholesterol out of our hepatocyte directly. Okay, so bile contains a lot of free cholesterol, and this free cholesterol is being secreted from the hepatocytes uh, by these uh, two transporters here. So here is ABCG5 in green, and here is ABCG8 in pink here. Okay, right. Uh, now let's discuss that final protein which I was telling you about, um, which uh, is going to be upregulated by the liver X receptor alpha. Okay, so the final protein we're going to increase the expression of is a cytochrome P450 enzyme. Now, for short, cytochrome P450 enzymes are abbreviated always with this CYP. So the CY stands for cytochrome, and then the P stands for P450. Okay, so this is CYP, cytochrome P450, and specifically it's cytochrome P457A1. Now this is going to be involved in the uh, the transformation of cholesterol into bile acids, basically. Okay, so let's discuss this now. So basically, not all of the cholesterol will be excreted directly. Some of it will firstly be transformed into bile acids. And in order to do this, you need this enzyme, cytochrome P450. So if you upregulate cytochrome P450 7A1, uh, you're going to be able to convert cholesterol into bile acids, basically. Okay, these bile acids are then going to be excreted from uh, the um, from the hepatocyte into the bile as well, and it is also done by another ABC transporter. Okay, so the ABC transporter, which transports bile acids into the bile ducts, is ABCB11. Now, this is a full transporter with that normal structure. Okay, so I'll draw you a little diagram of what it looks like in a moment. So it makes up a transporter on its own, basically. It doesn't need to dimerize to form an, uh, a working transporter. So here is its first transmembrane domain, consisting of these six membranes spanning alpha helices. Okay, so this is transmembrane domain one. Then we have the nucleotide binding domain in the loop between transmembrane domain one and transmembrane domain two. And this is the nucleotide binding domain one. Then we have another cluster of six membranes spanning alpha helices, making up transmembrane domain two. And then finally, another nucleotide binding domain down here, which is the nucleotide binding domain 2. OK, and of course, the nucleotide binding domains can also be called the ATP binding cassettes. OK, so ABCB11 is a full transporter and therefore functions on its own. And it will transport the bile acids out of the hepatocyte and into the bile duct. And they uh, will also be excreted into the intestine. So this is the way that the hepatocytes get rid of the excess cholesterol that they have. They can excrete it, basically, into the intestine. Okay, right. So let me now talk to you about an example of a bile acid. Okay, so I want to talk to you about torocolic acid, which is an example of a bile acid, so that you at least have some intuition for what is meant by a bile acid. So there are many different bile acids. Uh, this sort of one of the archetypal examples would be torocolic acid. 
all of them are based on cholic acid. Okay, so let me show you the structure of cholic acid, which has a very similar structure to cholesterol. Okay, so uh, cholic acid has the sterile structure within it. So we'll start off by drawing the four steroid rings then. So here's our B ring here, this six-membered carbon ring. Here is our C ring, which is again a six-membered carbon ring. And here is our D ring, which is a five-membered carbon ring. Okay, we then have our alcohol group coming off carbon-free here. Okay, we then do have methyl groups coming off carbon-10 and carbon-13, just like in uh, cholesterol, but we don't have the double bond between carbon-5 and carbon-6. We then have an additional alcohol group coming off carbon-7 here. Okay, and we also have an alcohol group coming off this carbon up here. So which carbon is that? This is 10, this is 11, this is 12. So off carbon 12, we also have an alcohol group. Okay, then the group that we have coming off carbon 17, it bears similarities to the group that you have coming off cholesterol, but it's a five carbon carboxylic acid instead. So one, two, three, four, and then we're going to have a carboxylic acid up here. Okay, so this is the structure of cholic acid. Now, how do we convert this into taurocholic acid? Well, basically, you bind it to a molecule called taurine. Okay, and taurine is the old name uh, for a molecule that is now called 2-amino-ethane sulfonic acid. Okay, so 2-amino-ethane, and it should all be one word. It, it should now be sulfon, and then I'll have to go on to the next line, so sulfonic acid. Okay, so 2-amino-ethane sulfonic acid. Now, this allows us to work out what the structure of this is. So, ethane tells us that we've got a two-carbon molecule here. So, let's draw that first. Then, off the second carbon, we've got an amino group. So, I'll draw that on this side. And then, off the first carbon, we've got a sulfonic acid group. Now, what is the structure of a sulfonic acid group? Well, basically, the structure of sulfonic acid, you have a sulfur atom... And then it has two oxygen atoms double bound to it, like so. And then an alcohol group here. So that's the structure of sulfonic acid group. Okay, and you'll notice that this again has a similar structure to a carboxylic acid. We have a sulfur atom double bound to an oxygen with an alcohol group coming off it. That is quite similar to a carboxylic acid group. If we just replace that sulfur with a carbon there, that would be a carboxylic acid group. Okay, uh, so uh, this has similar properties to a carboxylic acid group. And indeed, the hydrogen that's attached to this alcohol group here, that can cleave off and go into solution, basically. Okay, and therefore this is considered an acid. So what we're going to do to create taurocholic acid is we're going to bind cholic acid to taurine. Now how are we going to do this? You might think we'll use the sulfonic acid group to attach to one of these alcohol groups, but in actual fact we're going to use the carboxylic acid group of the cholic acid molecule to bind to the amino group of the taurine molecule via an amide link. So we will take the alcohol group off the cholic acid, carboxylic acid group, will take a hydrogen off the amine group of the taurine molecule and will bind this nitrogen to this carbon here. Okay, so let's now draw this out then. So, finally then, the structure of taurocholic acid. So here is our A ring of the steroid structure. We then have our alcohol group coming off the third carbon here. We then have our B ring here. Okay, and then unchanged is the fact that we have this alcohol group coming off the seventh carbon here. We have the methyl group coming off the tenth carbon. Here is the C ring then, and we have an alcohol group coming off this twelve carbon up here. And then the D ring over here, which is this five membered ring. We have our methyl group coming off the thirteenth um, carbon here, and then we have this side group here, and we're going to have to be careful because otherwise I'm going to run out of space. Right, okay, so here is the carboxylic acid carbon which has the carbonyl group there. And now we have our amide link here. So we have our nitrogen atom here with that hydrogen coming off. Then we have these two carbons like so. Okay, so this is this carbon here and this is this carbon here. And I'll have to draw her off like this. We have our sulfur atom double bound to an oxygen atom twice with an alcohol group then coming off like that. 
Okay, so this then is the structure of toracolic acid. Okay, and it's an example of a bile acid. And you can see that we will synthesize this entire thing from cholesterol uh, through this cytochrome P457A1. So this overall then is the involvement of HDL in reverse cholesterol transport. It is a way of taking uh, cholesterol from cells which are overloaded with cholesterol and returning it back to the liver either directly through HDL particles or via the fact that the HDL particles have given it to LDL particles. Okay, uh, And then what the liver will do is it will use the cholesterol to make bile acids and it will secrete both free cholesterol and bile acids into the bile ducts basically and those will then be excreted from the body uh, in the intestines basically. So it's a way of getting rid of excess cholesterol basically and it's very very important in uh, protecting against atherosclerosis because uh, the HDL particles are capable of removing cholesterol from the foam cells in an atherosclerotic plaque. So if you have high levels of HDL, that's actually very protective against uh, cardiovascular disease because atherosclerosis is the start of uh, most of cardiovascular disease.